Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Mary Balliat with another one of our patient education videos that we're doing so that you have access to this whenever you would like. And today our topic is MTHFR. What is MTHFR and what do I need to know? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So the first thing is that we have what is known as a genetic code. And the genetic code is the thing that codes for proteins. So let's take a look at how that works. When we eat food, one of the amino acids that we need is methionine. And methionine can be part of body proteins, but also methionine does a methyl donation reaction where when it gives its methyl group away, it becomes homocysteine. So why are we interested in this? And this called the MTHFR enzyme that's going to help move things back over to methionine. So when I have a genetic code that codes for proteins, enzymes are proteins. And so what happens is that the enzyme we're gonna be interested in is called the MTHFR enzyme, known as methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. In the United States, 20 to 40% of white and Hispanic individuals have a genetic code defect where this enzyme right here does not work well. And so this enzyme really works with folic acid as methyl tetrahydrofolate and cobalamin, A12 as cobalamin. Now this molecule, we're gonna talk a lot about homocysteine and how important it is not to have it elevated in the blood. And we wanna be able to either move it back to methionine or get rid of it from the blood into the urine, which needs more vitamins. So this is folic acid and B12, but this is vitamin B6 is pyridoxal 5-phosphate. So why should I care about this enzyme MTHF5? And that's because I do not want homocysteine. One of the main ways we just saw to get rid of homocysteine is to use that enzyme to go back and make methionine. But if I look over here at this graphic, we can see that homocysteine actually causes cardiovascular disease. And that's because it leads to atherosclerosis. It actually damages the wall of the blood vessels. And now we then lay down placking, which is called atherosclerosis. Additionally, it damages the bone and can lead to osteoporosis. It damages the nerves, which can lead to dementia and Alzheimer's. Because it damages all cells, it can lead to cancer and inflammation. And diabetes is an inflammatory condition, as well as arthritis. So we definitely want to get rid of homocysteine. So this is what we really want to focus on is what enzymes get rid of homocysteine? So that brings up the question, where did the homocysteine come from? Well, it turns out that homocysteine is made when you give away this methyl group from methionine. So we see this little yellow methyl group. And when I take this away, instead of methionine now, which stands for methionine, for methyl, now I get homocysteine. So that's really it. I'm just missing that little yellow thing. Well, where did the yellow thing go? That little methyl group, which is a carbon with some hydrogens on it, is needed to make creatine and a creatinine. Uh, so creatine, which is important for creatine kinase, which is for muscle energy. It's also important to make carnitine, my little mnemonic is fat is too fat to walk into your mitochondria. It needs to drive its carnitine in. So we need it to make carnitine. When we're under stress and we're in fight or flight, we make a molecule called epinephrine, which we know of as adrenaline. But adrenaline actually has a methyl group on it. And so I actually need SAMI to make epinephrine. So if I'm stressed out, I'm going to have elevated homocysteine. If I'm making burning more fat because I'm exercising, I'm making more homocysteine. If my muscle is doing high impact aerobics and using creatine, I'm making more homocysteine. And if I'm doing neurotransmission, which is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is one of the most important neurotransmitters for the central nervous system, for the parasympathetic system, for the sympathetic system, and for the neuromuscular junction. So anytime... I'm doing the majority of my neurotransmission. I am using that methyl group to make choline and therefore I'm elevating my homocysteine level. 
Therefore, I want to get rid of the homocysteine. For the people without MTHFR, the way it works is this. I take this molecule called methyl tetrahydrofolate. It's one of the active forms of folic acid. The methyl group is given to B12. Then B12 becomes methyl B12, and the enzyme that converts homocysteine back to methionine actually takes methyl B12. But this vitamin B12 has to be just vitamin B12 or cobalamin. Cannot be cyanocobalamin. It cannot be something else because we have to be able to move that methyl group, this methyl from folic acid, give that methyl group to B12, give that methyl group to homocysteine. And when homocysteine has a methyl group, it becomes methionine. Then methionine is used to make acidenosyl methionine, which is the methyl donor, which makes homocysteine. So it's a cycle. It's called the methylation cycle. One other way to get rid of homocysteine for people who don't have MTHFR, even people who do, is to take homocysteine and using B6, we can actually make the amino acid cysteine, which is a very important amino acid. It is in all, it's a sulfur containing amino acid. It's an in insulin. It's in bone, it's in glutathione, which is a really important antioxidant. It's a precursor to taurine, which is the most important antioxidant in the heart and your white blood cells. So cysteine is a very important molecule. And so we don't have to be concerned about homocysteine provided it does not build up. But that means that without MTHFR, we need methylfolic acid, vitamin B12, not as any other B12, just by itself, or we need vitamin B6. Now, with people who have MTHFR, we are unable to make methyl tetrahydrofolate. The 40% of us, we just can't do it. So what happens is we don't have this little arrow over here. That means the only thing we can do is convert the homocysteine here up to methionine, and that's what I've shown here. The homocysteine plus methyl B12 becomes methionine. But now this methyl group did not come from methyl tetrahydrofolate, it came from being methyl B12. Well, how do I naturally get methyl B12? I eat meat. When bacteria work on meat, it always makes methyl B12. It is bacterial action on meat. But what if I'm vegan or I'm vegetarian or I just don't eat very, very much red meat? Now I'm gonna not have methyl B12 in my diet. I'm gonna have to take it. I'm gonna have to add methyl B12 if I have MTHFR. Also, I want to not get B6 deficient in order to get rid of homocysteine that causes the cardiovascular disease, the cancer, the arthritis, the diabetes, the osteoporosis. But vitamin B6 can get deficient from a drug-induced nutrient depletion if I'm on birth control pills, if I'm on hormone replacement therapy, if I'm doing a lot of coffee and tea and diuretics if I'm on antibiotics. So now I wanna make sure I have extra B6 to make sure I can then convert homocysteine to cysteine, which is a critically important amino acid, again, to make things like insulin and the antioxidant glutathione, the antioxidant taurine. So we want cysteine. And so homocysteine is what's called an intermediate. We don't want it to build up, but we are gonna use it either to make methionine with methyl B12 or cysteine. Marie Cadill at Cornell showed that for the 40% of us with MTHFR, the other way that we methylate is to use the methyl group from choline. And so choline has methyl groups and choline is in anything that has lecithin because lecithin is actually called phosphatidylcholine. Choline is converted in your liver to betaine, and betaine, which is naturally found in beets, and why beets are good for your heart, is that it is also a methyl donor. So for the people with MTHFR, I can get rid of homocysteine by either using methyl B12, not cyanocobalamin, or cyano B12, and not methyl folic acid, we don't have that step, that's not possible for us, or we can use betaine that either comes from beets or choline, or we have to have enough vitamin B6 without the drug-induced nutrient depletion or have enough in our diet so that we can make cysteine. Any of those things will get rid of the homocysteine. So there it is.
vitamin B6, methyl B12, and betaine from lecithin. Now, one carbon metabolism is very, very complicated. When I actually look at how the whole thing works together, this here is called the methylation cycle where we see the homocysteine to methionine, where we see the methyl B12 over here. We see this is the betaine. We see the homocysteine can become cysteine, that cysteine, that cysteine can become glutathione, can become taurine, but again, we need B6 as pyridoxal 5-phosphate, the active form. Maybe some of us can't make it. These are the reactions that we're using methyls for that's making homocysteine. For the people who do have MTHFR, they're not deficient in it. They're going to run this circle with this circle. But we have to remember each and every time, I cannot methylate both. And we're going to talk about this on a later slide. But it turns out that this circle that has to do with folic acid metabolism, which is quite complicated, is also in another little wheel with the neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine that make me feel calm and satisfied so that I'm not depressed or anxious. And then I could have these other problems with my enzymes over here. Or I can not just have a MTHFR defect, I can be missing this enzyme called COMT. And we're going to have a whole nother talk about COMT and how it has a massive impact on mood and can cause a negative feedback on this loop. But intriguingly, I'm also need to run my urea cycle so I can get rid of excess toxin. But I also need a thing called nitric oxide synthase. So I have nice big blood vessels plenty of blood getting to my brain, plenty of blood getting to my heart and my periphery. My hands are not cold. So one carbon metabolism, quite complicated, super interesting, but way beyond the scope of just this talk. So let's break it down. Let's say one more time that when I have MTHFR, I actually need vitamin B12 as methyl B12. Remember, homocysteine doesn't have a methyl group on it. When I put that little yellow circle on homocysteine, it becomes methionine. Methionine, good. It's in proteins. It's an amino acid. It's an essential amino acid. I have to have it in my diet or I have to be able to go back and remake it. And we see again that we need vitamin B6 as pyridoxal 5-phosphate or we need lecithin or we need beets. So any of those things is going to help us. And... Vitamin B12 comes in more forms than just methyl B12. And vitamin B12 has a myriad of things that it's used for. It's used for DNA synthesis in order to make red blood cells so I'm not anemic. It's very important for energy production because it makes the cytochromes and hemoglobin so that I can actually do what's called cellular respiration. It's really important to make myelin for the nerves. It's really important to make choline and the choline of acetylcholine. And here's our detoxification where I wanna make sure that I can get rid of the homocysteine. I can make the nitric oxide synthase. So all of that are things that B12 is doing, not just this. When we talk about what is the right form of B12 in nature, when I have bacteria action on meat, I make methylcobalamin. So this is a meat dependent, bacteria dependent step to have naturally forming methylcobalamin. Now my liver can put a methyl group on the cobalamin, but I would really like it to then just be cobalamin. When they give you a medicine, like a B12 shot, they give you cyanocobalamin. And the majority of vitamins on the market have cyanocobalamin. And this CN stands for cyanide, as in don't drink the Kool-Aid. Cyanide is toxic and can lead to death because it interferes with your mitochondria, it interferes with your red blood cells. And so according to the Mayo Clinic, the side effects of high dose cyanocobalamin that's way over 100%, which is common in a lot of vitamins and a lot of supplements. I can have fever and chills and coughs and hoarseness and low back pain and problems with urination and problems with my respiratory tract, runny nose, sneezing, sore throat. This is a real problem 
And a lot of times in practice, what I would see is people would seem to have these symptoms. I'm doing everything I can think of. And then I find out they're on very high dose cyanocobalamin, either because they got a B12 shot from their doctor or because they're taking a vitamin or a supplement or something that has a thousand percent of the RDA or 300 percent of the RDA of cyanocobalamin. Now I'm going to have this cyanide built up in my liver because I'm going to have to take it off. Then my liver is going to have to put a methyl group on that cobalt molecule in this massive molecule called B12. So that's really the thing about B12, but we didn't get to MTHFR because the F stands for folic acid. Now on the internet, they say that you really have to have what's called the folates, but here's the real biochemistry of what is the difference between folic acid and folates. Folic acid has these two hydrogens. The definition of an acid is that I can give hydrogens to my environment. When I give hydrogens to my environment, that's called giving hydrogens to my blood because in your body, your blood is the environment that everything is living in. The minute that I take in folic acid and it is absorbed in my intestines, immediately, as soon as it hits those intestinal cells and goes in the blood, it becomes folate. Now, folate is soluble, but folic acid is even more soluble. And so it's more digestible and absorbable. And so this is why normally folic acid is put in supplements because folic acid is easily absorbed into your uh, digestive tract and then it goes to your liver. The minute it's in your blood, it becomes this called folate. But folate is not alone what actually is gonna work in your body. The folic acid cycle or folic acid metabolism was figured out by Marie Cadell at Cornell, who I know personally. And what really happens is let's take a look. Here's the folic acid that was either in my vitamin or I ate it in my food. So folic acid is very high in things like spinach. That's really what it was named for because it's in the leaves. Now I use this really interesting vitamin called NADPH. Now the N stands for niacin, which is B3. But where did I make NADPH? NADPH is made only in the liver and the red blood cells in a thing called the pentose phosphate shunt. But I must have enough glucose in order to make all these active forms of folic acid. If I'm on a really big keto diet, I'm not going to have enough NADPH in order to take folic acid and make all the things I need to make from it. What's one of the things I need to make from it? I need to make this tetrahydrofolate or tetrahydrofolic acid. But in your body, this is tetrahydrofolate. Now, tetrahydrofolate is really important. It's called precursor to two forms of folic acid that are going to be needed for DNA metabolism. And that are these two here, the formals and the N5N10 methylene. So let's take a look at those. Now, I want to point out that not only did we need vitamin B3, but we also need this PLP, that stands for pyridoxal 5-phosphate. That is the active form of B6. This is why I always want to have all my B vitamins together because I need B3, niacin, to work along with B6. But when I have a vitamin that has niacin, my liver has to make NADPH from the pentose phosphate shunt. When I have pyridoxin or B6, I have to make pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is intriguingly a zinc-dependent step in order to convert pyridoxin or B6 to the active form. So for some people, they don't have enough zinc, maybe they don't have enough stomach acid, and so they really do better if they take some extra B6 as pyridoxal 5-phosphate, but only if they have a drug-induced nutrient depletion. Otherwise, 100% of B6 is going to totally work for you if you're not on a drug-induced nutrient depletion. Who depletes pyridoxin uh, in, the in the body? That is birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy, uh, antibiotics. Those things all make you need extra B6. So let's take a look at these two forms 
this here, which is called this guy over here, N5, N10, methylene tetrahydrofolate, and folic acid as uh, N5 formal tetrahydrofolate. What do they do? Those two forms actually are needed to make DNA. And I need DNA and RNA to make protein. If I do not have this, I cannot make healthy hair, skin, nails, red blood cells. Every single cell in my body needs to do a thing called mitosis or make another cell. And in order to do that, I need DNA and then DNA becomes RNA. And without these two forms of folic acid, I can't do it. So let's remind ourselves, I had folic acid either in my food or in my vitamins. I needed some sugar in my liver to make the active form of niacin so that I could make these two active forms. And I need pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is depleted again by hormone replacement therapy, birth control pills, and antibiotics. But the PLP can be depleted to 25 to 50 milligrams. And so I'm going to have to also add extra PLP if I'm in any of those medicines, that's going to be really important. And so now what do I do? I make formal tetrahydrofolate, which is in the purine rings. I need these two rings. They have two rings in them. They're called the purines. They're in DNA and in RNA. And I need methylene tetrahydrofolate to make this, the T that's in DNA, called thymine. And that is a methylene tetrahydrofolate dependent step. And this step actually is interfered with when you are on chemotherapy. It doesn't allow you to actually make more cells because they're trying to do no cancer cells. So they literally block this step here. Um, but we need that. To have, that's why when we're on uh, chemotherapy, we're going to lose our hair. Uh, we're going to get anemic. So we have to be able to do this to have great hair, to have great nails, to have great skin, to have enough red blood cells so that we're not anemic and we're not exhausted, to have enough white blood cells so we can fight infection and disease. All of that is absolutely dependent on folic acid as these two forms. So what happens then when I need this for DNA and RNA to do protein synthesis. That's this purple square here called nucleotide synthesis. This is going to really help us have good cell division and good cell repair. What happens with MTHFR is we can't go from this box to this box. This has been for thousands of years that people just can't go from this box to this box. And so what did they do since they didn't have this? It's not, it's not right to take another methyl folic acid because I don't have this step. What's really right is to take methyl B12. The worst possible thing I could do is take both methyl B12 and methyl folic acid. Now they're going to both come in. At the bottom there, we see them coming in. And now it's like having two hockey pucks. It's not how the game is played. I have to give this methyl group to just plain B12. If this is already methylated, I'm just not going to get that to happen. I wanted to show a picture of me when I didn't know this data, when everybody was talking about MTHFR, which I knew I had, and I was taking methyl tetrahydrofolate and methyl B12. This is a picture of me at age 55. This is a picture of me at age 68. This is me taking both methyl tetrahydrofolate and methyl B12. This is me not doing that knowing the biochemistry of this, saying I'm going to use all of my folic acid with my ability to have the right B vitamins, the right form of niacin that takes some sugar, not too keto, where I'm also going to be making the right forms of folic acid so I can make DNA and RNA. And now I'm going to have great hair, skin, nails, red blood cells, bone, all the things I need, more muscle mass, because I'm going to be able to do that. And then I'm going to have methyl B12 in my diet, either because I eat meat, that the bacteria makes it, or I have a supplement that has methyl B12. And now I'm going to take homocysteine and go to methionine. And now these two wheels do not overlap. But the worst thing would be 
for them to just jam up and not work at all. And so this is me, two different ages, taking what they told me to do. They just did not happen to know the literature. Me after Marie Cadell and I uh, worked together. She had done all the research. She told me everything. And then I started training and teaching people. It's very important not to methylate them both. And so I've had a lot of success getting rid of uh, anemias when we stopped doing that and not methylating both folic acid and methyl B12 because I have to have one hand free. I'm going to pass that methyl group back and forth. If both things have methyl groups, they're just going to hit each other and that's not going to work out. So the MTHFR enzyme that I'm missing and 40% of us are missing, it just takes this N5N10-methylene tetrahydrofolate that was needed to make DNA, and then it converts it using, again, the active form of niacin, which needs sugar to be made in the liver, and then it makes methyl tetrahydrofolate. That methyl tetrahydrofolate then gives its methyl group to everyday plain B12. Remember, not methylated B12 plain B12. I move this methyl group. I'm going to like use my phone, right? Methyl group from folic acid. Give my methyl group to B12. B12 gives its methyl group to homocysteine. Homocysteine now becomes methionine. I have to be able to pass it. If I can't pass it, I'm just getting jammed up. It's not how the game is paid, played. That's not right. So without MTHFR, folic acid, as methyl tetrahydrofolate gives just plain cobalamin, its methyl group, then this becomes tetrahydrofolate that then can go on to become the other forms of folic acid like formal tetrahydrofolate and uh, N5N10-methylene tetrahydrofolate. And then cobalamin becomes methylcobalamin. To convert homocysteine to methionine, though, needs this enzyme called methionine synthase. It uses only methylcobalamin, not methyl tetrahydrofolate, not together. Notice methyl here, methyl here. I'm going this way. They both can't have it. That this is not next to this. It's not how the game is played. So in summary, the biochemistry of one carbon metabolism is so complicated. If I'm getting my information from online media nutrition who do not have years and years, I've been teaching biochem since 1999 and I have a biochem degree from 1976 and that it just, they don't know biochem, that's the problem. So what is the take home message for the 40% of us, including me, who have MTHFR? I need choline from lecithin. I wanna have some kind of plate. So what does choline naturally come in? Choline or lecithin is naturally found in egg yolks, in nuts, and in chocolate. But I can also look and see, does my supplement have lecithin in it? And I want to make sure it's not an allergenic form of lecithin because a lot of people are allergic to soy today. And that's a very common form of lecithin, but maybe you're allergic and you can't have it. I could have beets. Beets are great food to eat regularly. They're high in betaine. That's going to also be a methyl group. Or I could have methyl B12 because I either took methyl B12 or I ate meat that had bacterial action on it, which is all meat when you buy meat and uh, it is converted by the bacteria. And that will convert the homocysteine into methionine. Then the other one, the purple one, folic acid is converted to all the other active forms of folate, but I have to have NADPH. Remember that took a little bit of sugar. Don't want to be too keto. I'm going to preferentially make DNA and RNA, which is going to make me make protein. And what do I have protein on? My skin, my hair, my nails, my muscles, my red blood cells. All of those things need my, uh, protein. So thank you. And you can always reach me at mbelly at, at potentialpowernutrition.com.